Okay, welcome to Mercy and Truth Bible Church. Today is April 2nd, 2nd or 1st? It's 2nd, 2nd, okay. It's not April Fool's Day, so uh, I saw, I sent a note to some of you guys. Uh, uh, it was a joke uh, talking about April 1st. He says April 1st has been canceled this year because because of the, such outlandish stuff that's going on in the world. It doesn't matter anymore. It's it's worse than uh, worse than any joke. Um, for those of you who don't realize, we're here in Chandler, Arizona. It's starting to get warm, um, which is causing a super bloom of uh, flowers, and we're all been suffering under the crushing effects of pollen. Um, so you can pray for us for our 78 and 80 degree weather. <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> we've been shoveling sunshine a lot here lately. It's been terrible. Um, so we're going to pick up where we left off last week, and we're continuing to study this crucifixion week. And I, I keep thinking I'm going to go faster than I am. And after I got done with the sermon, I'm still stuck on this fourth day here because there is so much there. And there's so much information that you need to know that we're going to go through it line by line, gospel and gospel. Um, and so it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be long, and we're starting a little bit late today. Uh, shame on all of you, but that's just the way it is. And uh, I've got you as a, as a, as a cap- captive group, and uh, so you are going to be captive here. Um, so when we last, last left our intrepid gang here of uh, disciples, uh, they're all huddled up uh, for an evening meal, meal where Jesus offered them wine, uh, symbolizing his blood and the bread, uh, uh, symbolizing his body. And it was all shed for the sinner about an event soon to come, right? He kept trying to explain to them, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going, my blood is going to be shed for you, and they're, and they're not getting it. Uh, they didn't understand the meaning of the events. So I want you to turn with me to Luke 22. And at this meal, you can see that even then, their human nature is getting the better of them. Remember, these men do not yet possess the Holy Spirit inside of them. And this is what a lot of people who aren't dispensationalists don't understand, the fact that in the Old Testament, the Spirit rested upon somebody unless they sinned, and then it could leave them. But in the New Testament, after Christ sheds his blood, once you confess your belief, then the Holy Spirit resides inside of you and is sealed inside there with you and rattles around and has to put up with your silly nonsense. So Luke 22, verse 24 and 30. And I'm going to go through this, and I'll keep interrupting as we go here. Uh, And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. So wait a minute, wait a minute. We're at the Last Supper here, and there's strife between the apostles? I bet you don't remember any preacher really highlighting that in some of your schools. But that's what it says, okay? Look at what they are arguing about. Now, this is pure human nature right down the line, right? Actually... Remember, it's not human nature, it's Satan's nature. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Yeah, there's a holy bunch for you, right? The holy bunch of 12 arguing about who's the, who's the best among them, right? Who's the greatest? But not to worry, because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ interve- intervenes and makes them feel kind of foolish. Verse 25, and he said unto them, the kings... Of the Gentiles, and this is important, the kings of the Gentiles, non-believers, exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Oh, we're here to help you. We're from the government, right? Benefactors, right? That's what kings do. But ye shall not be so. Ye shall not be so. That's all y'all, right? But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether he whether is is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth 
is it not he that sitteth at me? But I am among you as he that serveth. Okay. Jesus is the word created in the flesh. It's very important that we remember that. Okay. He is the creator. The word was the creator of all things. He points out here that he's here to serve, to serve man. Right? No, it's not a cookbook. It's, a, it's serving man to administer to him, to minister to his needs. And basically, so should all of them be, right? This is the problem that they're, they're, they're facing. They're, they're letting their humanness interfere with their spiritualness. It is by Jesus' example. And remember, Jesus always leads by example that the servant that gives us the modern-day picture, what it means to be in the service of the Lord. We look to Jesus as our example, okay? So when you're in a church, doesn't matter what church, all right, and you're picked upon by the, the, um, the people in power, the, or I shouldn't say power, in authority is, is more correct, for a position. And whatever that position is, whether that's a deacon, whether that's an assistant pastor, whether that's an audiovisual tech, okay, a singer in the choir, you're to serve as Jesus served. You're to do your due diligence, okay? You're to learn to love that service because your service is exactly that. It's a service to others. You're helping others. You're a cog in a machine. The machine doesn't work right unless you work right. And that's what everybody needs to learn and understand. That's what it means to have a fellowship, to have a church. We work together. We help one another. Okay? Now, you'll notice that the world of non-believers, the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over the masses. And what does that mean? When you exercise lordship, basically you're telling other people what to do. That is the natural inclination of a non-believer. Do this, don't do that, do this, do that, right? We see that in today's modern society. We see that with the Democrats, right? They, like, they love to tell you what to do, how to live your life. Do this, don't do that, right? That's not the way of our Lord. We serve others, okay? We don't tell others what to do, okay? Jesus clearly, clearly here in this scripture points out that this is what an unbeliever does, okay? And I think in our modern day society, we see that crystal clear, right? Remember something. When you are saved, you all have the same spirit inside of you. Each one of you that's sitting here today, when you confessed your belief in Jesus Christ and you accepted him in your heart, you have that identical spirit. Not any one of us in this room has a different spirit that's saved in the Lord. Okay? No matter what your position in the church you hold, you have that same spirit. And this is something that many denominations don't get. You're no different than me standing up here at the podium. You have a gift. God gave you a gift. He's working with you to bring that gift into um, fruition. Okay? My gift happens to be that I can talk. Okay? Others have other gifts of service. Okay? You have the same spirit. You can know exactly what I know. The only difference is you just need to learn to read your Bible more. That's all. That's the only difference. Many believers seem to forget this. Many churches, many pastors forget this, and they talk down and they lord it over their congregation, and that's wrong. Okay? The least of us is the most important. Verse 28, we're in Luke 22. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. So notice Jesus as a human being in the form of a man. Okay, the word 
made flesh, is subject to temptations. Notice it doesn't say he sinned, but he was subject to every temptation of man. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And what kingdom would that be? Well, that would be the kingdom of God, right? The spiritual kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The ultimate reward for the disciples, the 12 apostles, okay, and we're going to see, and we know about the replacement apostle that happens in Acts 1 to replace Judas, that is that they sit and they judge the 12 tribes of Israel. But you can't judge somebody unless you humble yourself and live the life of a servant. And notice also, what basis do you judge somebody on? There has to be a book of authority, just like, right, when you, when you get arrested by a police officer, why is he arresting you? Because you violated a law. And then you're sent to a court, and there's a judge who judges you whether you are guilty or innocent. Actually, it's, a, it's the jury, but the judge, you know, rules over that, uh, that jury and instructs the jury to find you guilty or innocent based upon the charges. Okay? So what are the apostles going to use? Well, they're going to use the word of God, right? That's why Jesus was there teaching them. He was expounding the word of God to them so that then they will be able to judge all of the 12 tribes of Israel as to following the word of God. Of the law. So let us continue in verse 31 and 34 here of Luke. And what we find in verse 21, or 31, excuse me. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, Strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Well, ain't that a funny thing to say? But I have prayed for thee. Okay, that's not really funny, but that's more encouraging, right? That thy faith shall not fail. Well, that's kind of funny. What do you mean, thy faith shall not fail? This guy's an apostle. Huh. You know, the holy, this is the same guy, Simon Peter, whom the Spirit of God revealed that this guy, Jesus, is the Christ. He's the Messiah of the, of the kingdom of God. And he's saying that thy faith fail not. I'm praying for you, man. Well, what happened to Peter here? And notice he says, and when thou art converted. Wait, What? And when thou art converted, you mean he's not converted now? Is that to be taken at face value? Peter is not yet converted. How about them apples, folks? All right? You notice, we as Bible believers, one of the things that we do is we read the word of God and we interpret it literally up until the point when you can't take it literally anymore. So, Jesus' own words are showing that at the Last Supper, Peter was yet to have a converted heart. Isn't that something? Huh. He is praying for Peter's faith. 
Peter's faith in who? Peter's faith in him, Jesus. That's what he's praying for. Hmm. Ain't that something? How about we turn to the Gospel of Mark and see the account that Mark puts in? Turn to Mark 14. Mark 14, um, verse 26 to 31. And we'll pick up the account there. While you're looking for that, I'm going to take my allergy pill. <clears throat> and when they had sung and him, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, <clears throat> All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Notice the words, for it is written, I shall, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. So the first thing we hear is that Jesus says, all of them, all ye, that's all y'all in Texan, that's the plural, the plural of y'all is all y'all, right? Every one of them, all 12 of them, are going to be offended because of Christ this night. Wow. Not a clean one in the bunch. We already, we've already seen that Peter's actually not converted. All those three and a half years, and he's not yet converted. Huh. wonder who preached that. Jesus did. Notice, for it is written. It is written. We see that in all the Gospels. Jesus Christ refers back to the Old Testament over and over again. It is written. Really? Are you telling me that God had a prophet and he prophesied about this time? Yes, sir. That's what I'm telling you. Almost 600 years before this event. Really? Yeah. Let's look it up. Turn to Zechariah chapter 13. Don't believe me? Here's a chance to prove that the Bible is the Word of God. See, if you read it, it's, it comes to life. God proves himself. This is a prophecy that was made in Zechariah 13, verse 7, okay, well over 600 years before the events actually transpired. And it's kind of an esoteric thing. All right, Let, let's read what it says. It says, Awake, O sword, okay, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Huh. How about that? Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So God knew. God knew in advance, and he had Zechariah write it down. Why? So you would believe. That's why. You need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus, that God, is who he says he is. Otherwise, he's just another man. He's just another Buddha. He's just another uh, prophet uh, of Allah. He's just another Muhammad. He's, he's just anybody. But he's not. He's God. And he tells you he's God because only God can see the end from the beginning and have somebody write it down. Oh, back to verse 28 of Mark. Go back to Mark 14, 28. Notice the words of Jesus. But after that, I am risen. I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet not I, yet will not I. 
No, no, no. You're all going to be offended. I'm, I'm, God, I'm not going to be offended. Come. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. That's three times. Or if you're in Europe, three times. Okay. But he shall be, but he spake the more vehemently. So now he's really, oh, no, no, no. Lord, you're wrong. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise, also they all. Ain't that something? Some guy's arguing with the God of the universe, telling him he knows better. I'm not going to deny you. No way, God. Oh, okay. All for one and one for all. I'm not going to desert you. Likewise, also they said all. Right? Likewise, also they said all. Yeah, they all. Said they all. Excuse me. So all the apostles said the same thing. Oh, we're, we're, we won't do, we're not going to abandon you, Jesus. We're with you to the death, to prison, whatever it takes. Hmm. Oh, really? Turn to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. We'll find out what the account in Matthew 26 says. We're going over this in excruciating detail. And the reason we're doing this is because we're unpacking these hidden nuggets in here that have been forgotten that are pertinent to the story. Matthew 26, verse 30. So we step back to the, <coughs> the uh, Last Supper here just before they left. And when they had sung a hymn and hymn, they went out unto the mount, out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Notice the words, For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So Matthew duly records exactly what Mark had recorded and Luke had recorded. But after... I am risen again. Uh, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. I will go before you into Galilee. Remember the words. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto them, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all of the disciples. Okay, so... Matthew records the same event. You know, they're all standing up to Jesus, the Lord of God of all the universe, and telling him, no, 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 we won't do it. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to leave you. But Jesus knows better. God knows better. God knows them more than they know themselves. Think about that. God knows you better than you know yourself. Let's read 30, verse 36 to 40 now. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, Seat ye here while I go and pray yonder. Kind of gives you the idea that Jesus Christ is a southerner, right? He's going to go pray yonder. I'm going yonder to pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. They saith un he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, 
Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And so what happens next? And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? So once in the Garden of Gethsemane, Geth, yeah, Gethsemane, Jesus separated Peter, James, and John, those are the sons of Zebedee, and went a bit, walked just a ways, set them down, and then moved from the group and asked them to pray with him. And they all fell asleep. How often do we do that when we sit down for our evening prayers? Oh, Lord, Jesus, forgive me. I'm Off we go, right? It's a common thing. It's common. Turn to Mark. I want to read in Mark. We're going to, Mark goes in a little bit more into the depth of the prayer. Mark 14, verse 32. So what you're learning here is that each one of these eyewitness accounts, okay, the four Gospels, four individual readers, four different perspectives of the same events, right? We've talked about this in the past, right? When there's an accident and you have four different people as witnesses, they each will give you something that's just a little bit different because the perspective of each person is just a little bit different. And they may add a little bit of something so that you can get the picture in your mind's eye of everything that happened. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said, saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed, If it were possible, the hour might pass from me. And he said, Abba, you know, that's, that's like us crying out, Daddy, Daddy, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus is pleading to his Father in heaven, is there another way to accomplish this task? He didn't lose faith here. He knows what's coming. And it's going to be gruesome. He's in the flesh of this body, this meat sack. His spirit is there in it. And it's going to be scourged. It's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. And not only that, all of the sins of the world are going to be laid on that body, on that flesh. And it's going to take him to hell. But he submits himself to his father's will because there really is no other way. In verse 37, as we find the rest of the story here, and he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith to Peter, Simon, Sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? So he's gone for an hour, and in that space of an hour, these guys just zonk out. Bunk. Watch ye and pray, notice the words, lest ye, that's all y'all again, enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. 
And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. So now he does it a second time. They're like, you're asleep again? Uh, uh, yeah, um, right? So Jesus repeats his prayer twice here. Same, same thing, same prayer. And he comes back and he finds the disciples are asleep again. All right? Their flesh is identical to our flesh. Okay? It's weak. They had a nice meal, right, just before this. They ate well, right? It's comfortable. It's not too cold outside, right? They took a short hike after they eat, and now it's a little past midnight. So their flesh is tired. Notice he tells the party, watch and pray. Why does he say this? It's for their benefit, lest ye enter into temptation. Ah, now you have to wonder about that. If Peter was more diligent in his prayer life, would he have denied Christ? Hmm. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Let's go to Luke now. See what Dr. Luke has recorded about these incidents. Luke 22. We're going to Luke 22, and we're going to go to verse 35. I know we're jumping around a lot, but we're getting each perspective, and we're going over this line by line because we're trying to pick out the nuggets, the understanding, the perspective that each of the disciples saw of the events that happened this monumental day in history. Verse 35, 2235. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip, scrip is money, right? Military, we use the term scrip, but in civilian life, most people don't. And shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. And he came out and went, as he wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. So go buy a sword. Jesus wants them to possess swords. I thought it was illegal for someone in a Roman-occupied territory to possess a sword, except unless you were in the Roman military. Isn't that interesting? But he wants you to possess it. He wants you to go buy a sword. Okay. That it be written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. Jesus was reckoned by the world, right, by everybody else in society, by the governments, the kings, the Gentiles that ruled over the land, all right, that they, that he was associated with criminals because they possessed a weapon, two weapons, in fact. It was written. Hmm. Notice in addition that Jesus said that the two swords was enough. Note that he didn't say that, you know, after I'm arrested, go ditch these swords. He didn't say that. They served the purpose to fulfill scripture, but he made no mention of their illegality. Why two swords for 12 men? Well, apparently it was sufficient to provide for self-defense, right? 
Now, that's not the subject of this sermon, but that's something to keep in mind. Again, we note, pray that ye enter not into temptation. This was advice given to the disciples, and it's advice that carries through every single dispensation. Imagine if every time you were tempted by one of your own personal weaknesses, whether that be food, alcohol, cigarettes, dope, porn, anger, backbiting, gossiping, if you first stopped and prayed, I wonder if God would give you the strength to overcome your urge. I tell you what, why don't you give that a try next time? You've tried everything else. Why don't you give that a try? Matthew 26. Let's jump back to Matthew. And let's bring this to a conclusion here. We've got a couple more verses to go through. We're, we're, we're inching forward here. We're inching forward to the point where he's going to be taken captive. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but a lot of stuff here. Matthew 26, verses 41 to 46. Watch and pray. There it is again. Watch and pray. That ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You don't have to tell us in this day and age that our flesh is weak. We see it all the time. You know, look at all of us. You know, we all have a few pounds here, a lot more pounds than we need. All right, the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time. This is the third time now, saying the same words. Then cometh to his disciples and saith to them, Sleep now and take your rest. Because right, he comes back and they're asleep again. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. So here they come. They had their chance to pray. And now, now all the world is about to change. So Jesus recognizes and I think you can, my personal take on this, and maybe you can read it too, is that he's, a, he's a bit disgusted with them, right? That his friends are sleeping when he needs them most. He, he accounted the disciples as friends. And he needed them most for prayer to uphold him before God, and they fell asleep. They'd given in to their flesh. Don't let this dissertation of these events be lost on you because we are the same way. These are people that worked and lived and were taught by Jesus every day for three and a half years, and all he asked them to do is after dinner sit and pray with me for an hour, and they fell asleep, not once, not twice, but three times. If they were taught for three and a half years by the master, God of the universe, and they fell asleep. What about you? You think you're going to fall asleep? I think so. I could be wrong. Prove me wrong. The apostles, the apostles gave in to their flesh, as you or I will, if we don't pray, and pray at the time of temptation. But most importantly, pray before so you don't fall into temptation. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus makes no bones about it in his statement. Those people that came out to take him to the cross are sinners. Luke 22, the last time we're going to read about these specific events, because now Dr. Luke adds a little bit of something here that is shocking Remember, people don't realize Luke is literally a doctor. 
a doctor of the day. How much knowledge did he have? I don't know. It doesn't say. But he's going to add something here that only a doctor would think may be important. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Okay, we've seen that three other times. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Oh, well, that's new. Isn't that something? We didn't see that in the other, the other accounts. Just thought he'd slip that in there. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Notice. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Wow. And when he arose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Now, it, now he puts a little bit more. They were sleeping because they were sorrowful. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now, well, isn't that something? If the disciples had stayed awake, they could have seen an angel. Huh. How about that? If you'd have stayed awake and prayed, maybe you'll see an angel one day too. They were right there. An angel came next to Jesus to comfort him. They could have seen it if they would have been awake. They were only a stone's throw away. How far can you throw a stone? 10 yards, 25 yards, 50 yards if you're really good? Interesting. That's enough to see an angel, I think. Right? A bright, luminescent white angel, right? Interesting. He was in such agony. Why? Because of the possibility of being crucified. Well, yeah, that's true, but not. But I, that's not everything. Okay. Think about what's going on. Upon his flesh, all of the sins of mankind will be clung when he's crucified, and with his spirit. He will take those sins down into hell. So all sins, past, present, and future of man, are going to be stuck on this flesh and this spirit that is called Jesus and will be taken into hell by him. And he will be separated for the first time in eternity from the Father. Three days and three nights. Never before in eternity has the word been separated from his father. He's sweating blood. He is in such extreme anguish. Other than this scriptural account, I've never even heard of people sweating blood. That's pretty much... That's pretty much... Uh, a, a trial. Okay? Let's go back to Mark. And where are we at? Okay. We got we got another two pages. Well, another page and a half here. So just, just hold on because we're getting there. Now you're going to see something really strange if that wasn't strange enough. All right? Mark 14, verse 41. And he cometh the third time and say unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Right? Very similar to the other accounts. But now look. And immediately while he yet spake, cometh Judas. Oh, here comes Judas. Remember the guy that betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver? For three, three months' wages. This guy turned over the, the Lord, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, 
that same as he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straight away to him and saith, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and, betr and took him. <laughs> Sinners one and all, right? Betrayed by a kiss. Think about that. The ultimate in betrayal. Now you know where the mafia gets it from, right? The mafia gives you a kiss and off you go. It's the penultimate in showing the complete disdain for the love of the word of God. Remember, God is love. How do you show somebody that you love them? Well, you usually give them a kiss, right? Oh, give your wife a kiss, your loved one, whatever. So this is a completely satanic act. Remember, Satan inhibited or inhabited, excuse me, Judas. So let's see what Matthew says about these events. We're going to go to the same thing, but we're going to go to Matthew 26, and we're going to read it. Matthew 26, 47, 56. Those events. And while he yet spake, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude of staves from the He talks about Judas as being one of the twelve. All right? So he's he's he was with Jesus too. You know, we're talking about praying and temptation. Jesus, uh, Judas, Judas gave right into it, even though he was there with them all. Prayed him, gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he. With he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said in, unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So notice it appears in Scripture that there's a little bit of confusion with Jesus, right? Because when you kiss someone, you're expressing an act of love. So Jesus is like, huh? Jesus is not the author of confusion. Jesus had to ask him, what are you here for? Because it, it reads as if Jesus is a little bit shocked as to, you gave me a kiss and yet you're here to kill me, betray me. Really? You couldn't just point them out to me? You got to kiss me? It's, 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 it's literally shocking when you think about it. And behold, one of them, which was with Jesus, this is verse 51, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Then saith Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. Good advice. Don't live by the sword, right? Meaning professional soldiers, eh, they end up dying. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how they shall but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Oh, we're looking for another scriptural fulfillment here. That thus it must be. Now, we know, because we're going to read a, a little bit further on, that it's Peter that, that takes his sword. He wants to show his allegiance, right? Remember, he swore, I, I'm not going, I'm not going to, I'm not going to desert you, Jesus, right? So he whips out a sword, and he takes a swing at this guy. Probably, my guess is, that he's probably trying to take his head off, but the guy ducks and he only gets a piece of his ear and chops his ear off. Notice that Jesus' response is quite remarkable. What is more remarkable is the response of the entire group of soldiers. They seem to be very docile. They don't seem to be fighting back at all. Right? If you just read this lone account in Matthew, you'd be like, 
Something doesn't add up. We've got a, we've got a cohort of soldiers that came out to arrest Jesus. Some guy takes a, you know, he's identified in the crowd by a kiss. This guy, one of his followers, takes out a sword, chops off the ear of one of the attendants, and they don't seem to do anything. That's peculiar, according to this account. We need to read further. In that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, are ye come out as a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. There we go again. He's fulfilling the scriptures. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. So that all must be fulfilled. Remember what Zechariah said about the disciples. Okay. So let's read what Luke says. Then we're going to read what Mark says. And we're not going to get the answer until what John, until John finally chimes in and fills in the picture. Because we're going to read two other accounts of this entirety. We'll get to John, and that'll be it for the day. So, so follow along with me. I know this is a little bit long-winded. And uh, Luke 22, verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Every time I read that, it's just like, you sick son of a gun. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou son of man with a kiss? Right? So there it is, right? There's the confusion. Jesus is like, really? You love me? You, 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 you falsely love me? You're going to kiss me? You're going to kiss me to betray me? It's horrific. It's satanic. It's the height of satanic, right? God is love. You're betraying the God of love with a kiss to be executed. Think about that. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, meaning allow me to continue. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and elders, which were come to him, be ye come out as a thief against a thief with swords and staves. So Peter asks him, and then, or somebody asks him, should we take our sword? And then Peter just instantly takes it out and lops the guy's ear off. Again, probably going for his head, but the guy ducked and <laughs> lost his ear. But all the other people are just standing around, soldiers not doing anything. Doesn't that seem odd to you? It does. It should. You should be shocked. Like, what's going on? Are these soldiers, like, not all there? Maybe, maybe, the, maybe Mark has an answer. Let's read Mark. Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 47 to 52. And one of them stood by drew a sword, and smote the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief, with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. No, they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth, cast about his naked body, and the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, so we mark, again, we still don't know why this went on, but as we're going through here, all of a sudden, everybody leaves. They run away after the guy cuts his sword off. You know, they, oh, we're leaving. They left, 
And somebody doesn't have their clothes on. We later learn, find out that's John, right? And he's, you know, because he was sleeping. I guess the guy likes to sleep naked, right? And just had a jacket on, right? They tried to rip his clothes. They tried to lay hold of him, and he ended up ripping his clothes off. And so he's got a blanket around him. They tried to grab him, and he runs away. He'd rather be run naked than get caught with Jesus. Wait a minute, I thought you said you were going to stay around and hang around with Jesus. You, you were going to go to prison with him. You were going to be killed with him. I guess not. You'd rather run around naked. There's another thing about Satanism, right? Nakedness. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, you want to know the rest of the story? You want to fill all the pieces of the puzzle in? You have to read the fourth account. Let's see what John says. John is different than the other three Gospels. John really is the spiritual account of the things that happened here. John 18, now we're going to see all the pieces of the puzzle. When you put this together, all of a sudden you go, oh, now everything starts to make sense. Without these four eyewitness accounts, you can't get the full picture. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron. Where was a garden? And we know that's the Garden of Gethsemane, right, from the previous accounts. Unto the which he entered and his disciples. Okay, so we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus also, which betrayed him, knew the place. So Jesus knew that Judas knew it, and so, okay, here we go. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Okay? So he's coming out to get Jesus. All right? So that fits with the other accounts, right? We, we, we see that. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? So here comes the band. You know, Jesus is there, confronts him and says, Whom seek ye? Then answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Now notice the very next words. And this explains all the peculiar behavior that went on in the other three gospel accounts that you don't get until this book of John. As soon as he had said unto them, I am, notice the words, I am he, they went backward and fell on the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. So pay attention. Words matter. Judas kisses Jesus. And then they ask him, who are you seeking? And he says, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. There is so much power in the word. Remember, I am. Who is the I am? I am is the God of the Old Testament. When Moses was on the mountain, he says, what name shall I call you? Who are you? He says, I am. And in Jesus Christ, the living word of God, the same one, says, I am he. So Jesus has been so prayed up now with power in the word of God when he speaks he knocks the entirety of the soldiers and the compliment literally on their arse, right down on their butt. Speaks, bam, notice, they fell backward. They went backward and fell to the ground. Wow. So now do you see all of a sudden things have changed a little bit? And so when Peter stands up and lops off the ear, Nobody really does anything because they're on their behinds. The very power of God. 
God speak, and it existed, right? Spoke into existence the world. He spoke, I am he. <laughs> Bam, down they went. Like a, like a bunch of bowling pins. Think about that. Now, Jesus says, and it almost is in a mocking term. It, it, if, if you read it, it kind of like he's, he's almost mocking them, right? Now they're on their butts, right? Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That he, saying it, might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So the guy who just knocked you on your fanny with his words, saying, I am he, right, says, hey, could you let the others go? Um, what do you think their response was? Uh, yeah, okay. Right? Think about that. Think about that. They're, they're out of their mind. They're, they're afraid to death. As soon as he said that, they fell back. Peter picks up a sword, chops the ear off, and he's, no, 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 stop that. And he heals the guy's ear. Poor Malchus, right? Puts his ear back together, right? Because Peter wanted to be a tough guy, right? Verse 10, then Simon Peter, having the sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword un into the sheath. The cup which thy father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So now you know the rest of the story, okay? So while the guards are sitting on their fanny on the ground, by the literal power of God, okay, emanating from the mouth of the word, Peter jumped up, tried to cut off the, he literally probably tried to cut off the head of Malchus, getting his, only his ear. Jesus issues a correction, okay? He miraculously heals Malchus' ear in the presence of them all. So they're all witnesses to a miracle, two miracles, in fact. One is the power of them getting thrown to the ground by the word of God, and the second is they get to witness the healing. Hmm. It kind of shows you a different side of the events that took place than Mel Gibson's Hollywoodized version of what went on in the garden, right? We always like to bash on Catholics a little bit. Yeah, see, they, they, they get things wrong because they can't read. They can't seem to read all four accounts, all right? We see what went on. These people were scared to death. They were scared to death of Jesus, right? And we're going to read next week that the guards at the temple didn't see this, so they're not, they have a complete disdain for Jesus Christ, and they strike him and they hit him because they didn't see these events, okay? You notice that the guards, when they get their composure back, okay, they go after John and they, they try to grab him and they rip his clothes off, all right? So they're, they're like, now they're going to lead Jesus back to the Sanhedrin to be judged, okay? And I'm sorry this whole event is taking a long time, but I'm trying to point out to you each of the little pictures in history that have been completely forgotten. People miss, you know, the, the preachers of the world, they, they don't cover these things. But when you diligently read all four accounts, you're going to see this event come to life before your eyes, and you're going to know, as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. So that'll be it for this week, and I hope you all learned something today. And be safe, be healthy, and go on to your lives and continue to pray. Pray always. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.